right, welcome everyone to the IDSA SF Academy of Art University School of Industrial Design Winter Show. We're excited to showcase some of our best uh, work from our students from the fall 2020 semester. Um, thank you all for, for joining us and also a big thank you to the judges for coming out and uh, supporting our students at the show. Andrew Putman will be your host tonight and I will be your co-host. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get right to it. We're gonna introduce our judging panel. Uh, afterwards, we will um, introduce uh, our students and also provide you the links for you all to be able to visit our Winter Show website, as well as the Survey Monkey link for you to be able to go and vote for the People's Choice. Uh, we have six students who will be presenting today. Um, we will have four winners of scholarships, best product, best transportation, most innovative concept, will go home with $2,500. People's Choice will go home with $2,000. And the two finalists that are left will also receive $1,000 scholarships each. So tonight, everyone's going to be a winner. Um, thank you again all for, for joining us. And without further ado, here's Andy. Indeed, thanks so much for the introduction, Antonio. And uh, without further ado, let's let the panel introduce themselves. Uh, we'll start with the current chair of IDSA SF. So take it away, Valentina. Good evening, everyone. All right, Valentina, thanks so much. Uh, Reiko, if you wouldn't mind giving us a little bit of overview of your background and where you're coming from. Yes, I'm a CMF designer. I own my own business, Blink ID. Um, I got a Bachelor of Science at Cal State Long Beach. And um, I focus on CMF, colors, materials, and finishes. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, up next is Co Palmer. Give us a little taste of her background. Good evening. Thank you for having me. My name is Kohar Scott, and I am an assistant professor currently at um, San Jose State University. My background is in industrial design and also in CMF. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Now, the man, the myth, the legend, Tom <laughs> Gunther, if you wouldn't mind giving everybody a little bit of a rundown on your background. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm one of the other uh, alumni of Cal State uh, Long Beach. Um, uh, I think there's three of us on the on tonight. I'm not sure. Hopefully there's more. Uh, I'm formerly uh, the director of Hewlett Packard of Design and uh, retired and have been teaching ever since uh, 2000. And um, it's it's a joy to be with you guys. So I'm really looking forward to this tonight. Yeah, retired maybe in spirit, but never actually in practice. Am I right? That's uh, that's the way it works. Fantastic. And up next is Melvin, who's an uh, AAU grad. Give us a little background, Melvin. Hey everyone, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I currently work at uh, Ford Motor Company at an, at an internal design organization called D Ford. I'm currently assigned to our autonomous vehicles unit. And um, the team and I were responsible for overseeing the end-to-end -end, uh, experience. What's that going to be? How we're going to roll out, and all the services that uh, will get embodied into that. Um, yeah, that's great. Always big things popping with Melvin. We're glad to have you. Thanks so much for being along. Uh, another AAU alum, Aaron's joining us as well. Hey guys, uh, Aaron Stitch. Um, I was a student at AAU just like you guys 10 years ago. Happy to be here. Now I'm at uh, General Motors in Detroit. Um, been designing for a handful of the brands, Chevrolet, Buick, Cadillac currently. Uh, interior is exterior, so I um, have a, a range of experience at General Motors. So happy to be here. Uh, can't wait to see you the work. Awesome. Thanks again for joining us, Aaron. Uh, a little bit about the judging criteria moving forward. Uh, the judges are going to be looking at research and design processes, the innovation of said entity, uh, its overall marketability, and the visual communication of the project. For this evening's finalists, you have with you 
uh, Heidi, who's going to be showing you the embrace. Alex Altino showing you the drip. We got Can Rom coming through with House Planting 101. Natalia Oskina is bringing you the multi. On the trans side, Santiago Bastidas is bringing you the Jeep Precog. And Jenner is going to show you a little bit about his concept for the Rivian SR1. Uh, as a note to everybody, just please remember, cast your votes, have your voice heard. It's the best way to play along from home. And I think you're going to love what you see. So to that, and without further ado, let's get into the product section. First up to bat, Heidi's going to give us a little overview of her all embracing furniture project. Hi, good evening judges and all the people who be with us. I'm Yi Han Liao. You can also call me Heidi. And now I'm going to bring you into my design world. Let me introduce the Embrace. The Embrace is an immersive sitting that any person can enjoy it. My intention is to create a sitting that is soft, cozy, and satisfied. My ideas start from the shape of sea animal, a nominee, explore and develop its unique form into my final design. To create and focus at the feeling I want users to have, I also explore several material and build a full size skilled sitting by myself. To clearly describe my final design, the three best three words will be comfy, flexible, and playful. From this page, you can see the embrace allow users to use it for all parts of the day. Welcome and enjoy to the embrace. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Heidi. I think that illustrates, if nothing else, that we all could use a hug about this time of day, eh? Yes. Heidi, I, I have a question. This is John Gunther. Uh, can you talk just real briefly about some of the material investigation that you looked at uh, considering staining and, and uh, various types of contaminants that would uh, be on the material itself. Uh, have you looked into some of the practicality of cleaning and washing and those type of things? Yes, uh, I've been mean, just uh, exploring the fabric and the filters at the same time. And for the fabric, I also um, like explore the like different kind, but also feel like soft, cozy feeling. And the feel for filler, I explore the memory foam and different kind of foam. And to test it, to, I, to make the user to have the feeling I also wanted. And for the cleaning part, I believe that at the final is like a big doll. So you can send it to like air, uh, Sorry, dry clean shop to like easily to make a clean. I don't know if I answer your question. Yes, that's very good. I was just yeah. curious about uh, how much you had investigated that aspect of it. So thank you. Thank you. I have a question for you. It's Valentina. 
Um, did you think about the possibility of uh, exchanging or like uh, possibility of changing the outdoor finish, the material? So if I want to change color or maybe it gets too dirty and I want to change it, it seems to me that uh, the cut them, uh, the polyester fiber, which is uh, inside is just loose uh, within uh, in the spandex fabric. So did you think uh, maybe you need uh, another layer of containing all the filling? Maybe this will give also a little bit of more structure. It seems to me that the structure is going to be lost very quickly in this product. So I think that the life of this product might be a bit too short. Okay. Uh, I also be explore about this. And now I'm still testing because before I also used the uh, um, filler, which has the cotton shell, but it's a bit hard when you use in it, if you have like extra layer of cotton shell, but this is the part I'm still explore how to mm -hmm. make it like change and probably like user can change the color as well. If mm -hmm. you want to. <clears throat> have you done some, how structural is uh, this uh, seating? How much someone that weighs uh, 90 pounds or someone who weighs 200 pounds? Uh, We'll sit on this sitting. It's a soft sitting, so I believe it can um, like have a big range of the weight, like it can support any weight of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm just asking, because I'm just wondering if you have a target in your head, you know, who would be an ideal, uh, you know, user for your product. Yeah. I mean, I can also test it if you want, like, I have the sitting behind me. <laughs> <laughs> you are probably very light as well. <laughs> okay, we have to try it. Did Tom try it? That, that's the one he should No, try. not this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you so much. Hey, I had a, I had a question a... on the... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'll okay. go. Um, I had a question on, on your uh, patterning. What was your process like on that? Did you go through um, a few iterations? Was it an exploration? Um, were you satisfied with your outcome? And, and maybe the structural stitching in between the forms? You mean my collar pattern? The, the, the patterning of um, the, the cut and sew of these pieces. Yeah, putting them together and, and developing that form. Mm -hmm. um, just curious about that process. I, you know, I'm, I was wondering, maybe I missed a slide though, but yeah, I think it's kind of a very inventive um, crate structure that you have here. Yeah. Just wondering, yeah. Uh, I have few picture of my process and um, probably like a bit front page. Yeah, at the left down below, I choose a fabric and of course I cut the um, slide like, <laughs> the long piece of fabric and I saw it myself and also like you making doll you stitch it like each of a part and then make into this shape did I answer your question <laughs> yeah I was just wondering if you went through iterations um as you were developing this shape different different shapes and different um ways to support weight kind of like the the previous question as well yeah. That's great. Yeah, that's great right there. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I can see the difference in the, the stitching between that's neat. I had a question about the, the colors. I, I really like the colors. Um, they're feminine, but not too, you know, sugar sweet. And I was wondering, um, how did you go about choosing the colors? I choose a color because I want my stitching to have elegant, calm ambience, but also have a a uh, vivacious characteristic of this sitting because it's playful. So that's why I choose a bit like dark reddish color. Yeah, I like them. They're subdued. Thank you. They're calm and cozy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had the same questions as Aaron and also Reiko, and I wanted to congratulate you on executing on this concept during these challenging times. Yeah. So, and also, I can see your inspiration and how it reflects in your final uh, product. So congrats on that. 
Let's move on to Alex's take on a mindful eating experience. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Alex and this is Drip Project. So the team for my class was the development of my experience. And from an outsider point of view, like me, I got here in the US two years ago and I could see like how people from here have a strong connection with food. So it was like an opportunity to work with. So also with the uh, eating, we have the problem with uh, like in the US, where the obesity rate is reaching 40%. So I had like a focus group to try to develop opportunities and see problems, but I could have more insights. Someone from the industry, a nutritionist is helping me during this project. And he told me like the people don't know what to eat, like carbs, protein, fat, and how much of each portion to eat. So he, is, he told me also even small changes can bring Bigger results. So the idea was how we design a mind, uh, mindful eating experience that also enhance our food knowledge. So I invited a couple of people to eat in front of me to see this environment and see what they do, what they have, what they interact with. This is my um, brainstorming. The idea in doing the brainstorming was to how could we bring more technology to our table in order to have a mindful experience and bring more food knowledge. This is, was my ideation. We started like in a plate environment and then we had this inspiration in the drip, in the water dripping in this movement of the water. We developed a couple uh, mock-ups to see how the people were interacting and the thing was like during this stage we could see like we should have two separate parts a base and a plate because we need to clean the plate we need to heat the plate this is my inspiration board it's really clean approachable and So basically we have a base and a plate in glass and you place the plate, the plate in the middle of the, this base. And then like we have the camera to uh, identify the food and the weight control by this ring in, in our base. We have colors and that's it. Thanks Alex, I can see Aaron's eyeballs. Okay kind of coursing over that exploded view. I'm sure you've got some questions to start. Yeah, it was a beautiful presentation. I mean, you're, um, I just wanna say that your uh, kind of visual communication skills are, are great. Um, I thought the aesthetic was really cool. I think there's yeah, a good sensibility to, um, to you know, the, the parting lines that you put on here and the gap between everything and the manufacturability supposedly of this and what you're thinking of, um, it's cool. I just wanted to say it's a cool project. Thank you, Aaron. Hey, Alex, Melvin here. Uh, first no. of all, that's a really thoughtful project. And uh, it looked like you, you did a, a good amount of research um, with people. You sat with people, you ate with people. And I'm just curious if you could help us identify or pull surface some insights that you felt were instrumental uh, in informing your sketches, um, uh, some, of, some of your final design decisions and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically, like, if you look to the, this picture, as you can see, most of the people there are interacting also with the cell phone. And in three, three of them, they have this table map 
that. That was something that I saw like after I was going in the direction of the plate to do something with the plates, but we have our hands next to our plates when we are eating. So we can interact with this area. And you can see in the pictures we have this. And so that was what I went through. And that's why we chose to do this table max, like this environment to have the plates in, in the middle. Yeah. And, and, and one more question uh, on top of that, I was wondering too, if you had an idea of where you feel based on your research, um, where this would exist, would it be in just your typical household of people who are very interested in the nutrition? Would it be under the guidance of a nutritionist uh, used in, in, in what kind of setting would this be most appropriate in? Yeah, first of all, like for regular people at home, but like talking with people and showing the presentation, uh, like marketing people, they say like, oh, let's see, I can see this in a restaurant. You can see people interacting. Oh, we don't need, we can give like some ads, advertising, or even with kids, kids can have problems eating. We can have like how to build this thing in different like environments. The first idea was to have at home because in one of my insights from the uh, focus group, they say, like they are eating, people are eating more at home. And the idea is not to bring like the, your table mat to outside, but if you learn that egg, sometimes it's good or bread, sometimes it's good. You're gonna have this um, knowledge, it's gonna be with you. So no matter what, you're gonna learn at home, but you're gonna have this uh, uh, knowledge with you, food knowledge. <laughs> Very cool, thank you. Hi Alex, it's Valentina. Um, Hi, Valentina. It, congratulations, um, very nice pro project, uh, really nicely presented. I agree with the what, and I had some questions that they have already asked you. Uh, the only question they have not asked you is about the technology behind. Uh, mm -hmm. Why the camera, especially in a vertical typology of stack like this image? What a camera would capture of a toast with an avocado and an egg, for example. So where did you come up with this technology and why did you decide to apply this technology in terms of, you know, food uh, uh, if you want, uh, analysis? And how that, in, in your idea, how that would work? Uh, actually, this um, identification of food is like, there is two big companies in San Francisco in the Bay Area they already do this kind of scan of food. So uh, it's not like something that I just invented. It's something that people are already using out there. So that's why I had I embed this technology in the product. Mm -hmm. Like the interaction is different. Most of these products, they are like something that you scan okay. the food. Uh, some people, some startups are doing this with the cell phone. But my idea was to have this uh, experience without any apps or anything else. The product is, gonna, is the main focus, the main product. <laughs> so that that mm -hmm. the idea. So basically, what they do, they they can scan by pictures. How they do this? They take a bunch of pictures of each like thing, <laughs> and then the camera can check and see. Oh, that's chicken. It's not like meat. But of course, it's a technology in development. But oh, of course. It's, it's, a, it's really interesting. Interesting. Anyways, excellent communication skills. Congratulations. Oh, really nice. You. Inspiring. Alex, this is John Gunther. I, I wanted to ask you just a very quick question. It seemed like your main objective is obesity. Uh, have you thought about um, health issues like diabetes and, and other issues where food is uh, a key part of that uh, well-being? Like last semester, I did another project with food and but was more focused on exercises. So like I was trying in the beginning, trying to find something like to in like, how do I do it? <laughs> like in uh, magical devices and like, I come up with a solution not for the cause, but why people get sick. 
because they don't do exercises and don't, they don't eat healthy. So I think eating for a lot of problems, healthy issues, I think is, is one of the main, I, I think like, it's not drugs, but it's the, the other side, like it's a way to prevent uh, our health issues, definitely for the most different ways. I just had like obesity because it's like almost half of the United States. So it was like a, was a kind of shock for me. Like we are 42%. So, but definitely can be for other uh, um, yeah, I want to echo, this is Kohar Scott, I want to echo the um, congratulations on your visual, visual communication and your storytelling. You really do communicate very clearly your process, your research, and you do a great job of illustrating very, very succinctly. Um, so good job on that. Uh, I have a question about the UI. Is your intention to have an illumination with a white surface? Yeah. They like in the beginning I was trying to do something like Kindle, like white and gray, like the letters, but I just feel like this is a little bit more uh, modern that goes with my inspiration. I feel like it can be a problem, definitely. That's why I was thinking in different colors. So maybe a gray with the white letters. So definitely something that, uh, I could have like even like the other colors with the UI also to to have this contrast between background and letters, but yeah, the idea was to have the hero shot with something that uh, illustrates my inspiration. So that's why. I'm I'm glad you're thinking about all that. Yes, we we do as designers um, focus on on the aesthetic and telling that story, and in the end it's good to also consider and consider how it's gonna be uh, for the user experience and to make sure that there's enough contrast. So it's visible and in the size and the scale and everything as well. So I'm glad you're thinking about that as well. Alex has led us on a nice little journey of nourishing the human. So Ken's gonna take us on a little trip about nourishing your space. Hi everyone, um, my name is Ken and uh, today I want to introduce you guys about my latest design, uh, which is uh, House Painting 101. So House Painting 101 is a football indoor gardening workstation that is designed for beginners who want to start planting as a new hobby or people who don't have a proper location to work their plants at home. During my research process, there are two things I found out that is most interesting to me. First is, especially in San Francisco area, people, a lot of people living in a small space and uh, it's hard for them to clean the space after they done, done working on their plants. Uh, and uh, that leads to the second found out, uh, which is uh, a lot of people come out with their own solution. Uh, uh, they put a, a large trash bags or a newspaper prints underneath when they report in so they can keep the space clean afterwards. That is not the ideal solution for this problem. So I started to do my ideation and I did some thumbnails. Um, and with the help from my professor, Mark Blocky, we finalized the concept B might be the best direction to go to move forward with. Um, here is a storyboard to tell us how this product works. Uh, at the left side, it's a GIF uh, to tell you how to open it and uh, you work on your plans on the tree. And uh, after the user done using the, the these products, they can uh, puts the dirt, uh, then can pick up the tree and uh, just dump the dirt into a trash can. And uh, after that, they can de decide either wash this product since it's made out of cork or um, uh, fold it back and put on your bookshelf and uh, save a lot of space. Here is my moon board. That's how I uh, get my inspiration from and uh, finalize my concepts. Here's a concept sketch as well. 
and uh, the hero shot to show the details of my products. Since this is made out of uh, recycled cork, uh, so it's perfect for these products because it's water and dust resistance. And uh, as you can see from the left, the uh, right sides, uh, I made a little uh, small cutouts, uh, so it helps the user to easier pick up the tools. Uh, to to so, so a, a little bit of improvement for the user experience. So here is the detailed shots for my tool design. Since I'm designing something to replace trash bags and uh, uh, newspaper prints, I want to uh, this, this product to be more eco-friendly. So I decide to use uh, recycled cork. And uh, uh, for the tool two design, uh, um, I decide to use recycled plastics uh, for the shovel. And uh, for the other side, uh, it's I decide to use uh, recycled cork. So as uh, so the other side works as a aerating sticks, which helps the user punch holes on the soil. So which creates a hose to allow the plants breathe in more air. And uh, since I'm designing this products as an eco-friendly product, I decide to use a recycled paper for the packaging as well. Also on the front page of the packaging, uh, I put the user guide on it. So when the user looks at uh, these products in the shops and will know what it is and uh, how to use it. This product does not revolutionize gardening. However, it provides a smooth introduction for beginners and uh, for people who live in a Thai space. And uh, more importantly, since this is made out of cork, uh, at the end of this product's life circle, uh, the user can put this in compost. And thank you so much for having me and let's start planting today. Thank you guys. Any questions? This is Rachel Morrison. And I'd like to say that um, I really like this idea, especially during the pandemic. I think a lot of people have turned to planting and gardening and um, you've made a nice simple kit um, with a nice tool. I haven't seen anything like this out there. Um, and um, because it's made out of eco-friendly materials, um, I think this would do really well on the market right now. <laughs> so good Thank job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I'm super excited about the um, way that you've addressed sustainability. I like the, I'm a big fan of the Kanban style of um, packaging and, you know, mm -hmm. telling the user how to, uh, how to uh, use your product. I think that's um, very innovative and, and very marketable. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, it's Valentino. I agree with what Rico and Koha have said. Really nice, congratulations. Uh, absolutely marketable. I only have a question. In one slide, I have seen a very shy intent of looking at colors. Yeah, in this slide, there are some, mm -hmm. is this a reference? Is this what uh, maybe, you know, the product some ideas for the product, maybe for the tool or maybe for the wrapping or maybe, I don't know, uh, or maybe just uh, inspiration. So, so the color I pick up, uh, it's from the Moon, uh, inspiration board and uh, I used it, uh, mainly I used brown and dark brown for the, 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 the main parts. And uh, the, the other colors, it's what I use for the packaging because I feel like those color fits well and also it's representative of uh, eco-friendly and uh, calm and uh, it fits the whole environment of the gardening mm -hmm. kind of things, yeah. Yeah, maybe just from the point of view of the communication, maybe there may be a little bit of more effort in communicating better the idea, maybe it would have been uh, more, uh, you know, more more impactful on your audience huh? because it is okay. a strong product it's an interesting it's very simple so absolutely marketable tomorrow just probably a little bit of more communication uh, uh, you know creativity yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. you so much for this address thank you if, if i could add to that comment suppose that uh, the the user guide gets lost um, maybe there's an opportunity to consider color and stitching to help sort of 
uh, navigate uh, any other user. Say I gift this to someone and I lost the, the, the little piece of paper. How can color or, or, or even weights sort of help orient the user so they don't exactly need those instructions so much anymore? But the product itself sort of guides the user in case you lose that or you pass it on to someone else. But in general, I think it's a really cool idea, simple, it's pragmatic, and it's really addressing um, you know, a, a hobby right now that a lot of people have taken on. Um, very nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, very quickly, uh, nice job, Ken. Um, you showed some of the development sketches that you had um, done starting this project. And it occurred to me that you had a number of good ideas that maybe could be companions to this. Yeah. Um, so that you have maybe an entire product line instead of just one product. Um, seems like you had some ideas there that could be nice companions to more of a product line. That would be kind of an interesting statement to make when you present a project like this is what's next? Um, you know, where does this go? What can I do next? That, that type of thing. And certainly making a whole product line seems to just come right out of these sketches to me. Because this is just a one semester project. So, I, so that's why I want to focus on this concept instead of making more concepts. It's hard for me to, it's almost break my heart to like uh, not doing some other projects, uh, some other two concepts. And yeah, I, I totally get that. I, I, I have a lot of students that uh, give me that heartbreaking story, but uh, you know, I'm encouraging you to think forward from here from this class and um, you know maybe even enhance your portfolio uh, by doing work on your own to make some companion ideas coming out of this project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good advice. Thank you so much. Consider it sage device from a multi-dimensional thinker like Mr. Gunther. <laughs> oh God, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna hear the end of that, am I? You won't, not in the least. <laughs> well, to that, we've gone on a pretty good journey of nourishing the human and the space. And Natalia is gonna now take us on a little adventure about uh, the core of nourishment. And this is the, the, the formation of it in the kitchen. So Natalia, take it away. Thank you, Andy. Um, good evening, everybody. I apologize for the no background noise at this construction site. Um, so, this is my project, Multi, and wonderful company, uh, kitchen um, cook, a cookware company, for which sustainability is a really important question. Uh, so, Multi fits perfectly to the philosophy. So, what is Multi? Multi is a multi-purpose, long-lasting kitchen aid for food wrapping, baking, and keeping your hands and food from being burned. It's made out of gray, food grade silicone and embedded magnets. So you can snap together a variety of functional forms and shapes you can use in a kitchen. So what Multi is doing, basically rethinking the way we cook, bake and wrap and doing uh, our kitchens more responsible and sustainable through the long lasting and multi-using. It might work as a baking sheet, as an open baking form, as a closed baking form, as a wrap, trivet or kitchen mitt. So no single use items in the kitchen please. And single use item is what we're trying to solve here. So why um, single use items is a problem? Almost uh, not everyone know that um, single-use items like plastic wrap, baking paper, or aluminum foil is uh, rarely recyclable and non-reusable. So why they are rarely recyclable? Because they are light and easily can clog machinery. Almost in all cases will end up on landfills. Um, waste management in the U.S. unfortunately such that it's not so many percentage of the general waste are recyclable, compostable, or turned to energy. So plastic wrap, baking paper, aluminum foil will end up on landfill and will last there many 
hundreds of years, uh, releasing the toxins. So while observation, I noticed that not only wasteful issue, but uh, also that um, actually contribute a lot to wastefulness. It's uh, overused, the overused question. And um, on the top of it, uh, in household, they quite often clutter drawers and required constant supply. So what sustainable solution can be found to um, assist people who cook a lot at home uh, to preserve and the food and bake? Um, so that would be same flex, it has the same properties as uh, uh, listed above items. When I was thinking about aluminum foil, I immediately come up with the simple piece which I, which I have in my wardrobe. It's triangle segmented bag. It might uh, be banned in any direction as a, um, almost like um, aluminum foil. Yeah, and I, I, I banned this bag in different direction and it gave me a perfect flat shape. It gave me a form uh, and gave me a, a close form, open form and close form. So I think a little about um, fasteners um, and uh, figure out that it might be um, mechanical fasteners or magnets. So after a couple of testing, I decided to stick to magnets. So next slide, uh, I will show you a video. In this video, I'll quickly show you the whole process of prototype, prototyping uh, from paper from um, uh, to molding silicone, from uh, 3D printing, and uh, also um, for making a full size prototype. This is a paper being cut, segmented, trying to to uh, uh, how this form might, might shape and what it can does. Then I moved to silicone. I found the food grade silicone. I made a mold and cast it. Figure out that uh, I need to thin uh, thin the layer and to, to rein uh, reinforce it with those. This is a magnet test. It create an incredible snap. <laughs> it's difficult to, um, yeah, to, to convey it through the video. And the result was um, a soft, flexible uh, piece with incredible magnet snap. And this is a full-size prototype. This is how magnet fasteners work. I had to test them in uh, oven. So I found special type of magnets who can withstand a high temperature. And I test them in the oven under the highest uh, 250 Celsius temperature. And uh, only small one fell down. Uh, so the conclusion is that there is the magnets uh, which might work and help to bend forms, desired forms. Um, and the next slide, I will show you a full size prototype in use. Welcome to my kitchen. This is an open form, open baking form. Uh, now we are fixing the corners to form a open, sorry, this was a baking sheet and this is open baking form. We put it in the oven. Now we are fixing a closed baking form. It might be anything inside, fruit, meat, fish, um, next um, shape, it might be a wrap also for baking. It might be a piece of meat, like a nice steak or a nice fish steak. Um, this piece might also wrap and preserve food in the fridge and in the freezer. That's how you wash it. That's how you dry it. And that's how you store it. So, and, that, and that's what multi does. So multi uh, is a multi-purpose, long-lasting kitchen aid uh, for food wrapping and baking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. I'm looking at Kohar and she's got some big eyes over there. I do. I'm, I'm super excited. I'm really impressed with all of your 
um, ability to to um, explore in in your prototyping. I think you know, congrats on that. That's really great, especially you know during these times. So um, good job on that. Your exploration. Uh, I have a question. Um, I think everything that you've presented is totally viable. I think you did a great job of presenting your story and taking us through all those steps. I'm curious from a materials perspective, because of yes. course, silicone is the obvious choice and for food grade and all that. But I'm curious if you explored the different durometers of silicone in order to achieve adhesion instead of magnets, because of course, you know, having mixed materials. Sorry, I, I didn't get the question. If, if, if I, we're talking now about recyclability, right? Sorry, the um, way that you're closing the form. So yes. you're using uh, magnets. And I was curious right. if you explored material, um, the ability of the different types of stuff huh. to stick to itself. Um, yes, um, I explore the silicone, uh, the, the, the particular, I, I tested food grade silicone and it worked. That, that I know for sure, without even have special degree. Um, um, and also I know how the thickness of the silicone affect the magnetism, how magnets attract each other. So I also know um, that um, um, thickness create the air pockets between magnets and silicon, which might also affect the strength of mag uh, magnets. And um, um, yeah, so that, that was my research and I concluded it might be done. Uh, I think that if um, I would get an access to um, some manufacturer um, who specify on silicon, um, I probably would get even more answers. I tried, by the way. Good job. I, con Good job. I, I contacted three companies. Great. What was the substrate that they were all, there was um, the silicone that was sitting on top of in your prototype? The white, uh -huh. the white background? Oh, it was uh, a That one? That no, uh, the final prototype. A final prototype. That was a baking mat. Okay. I found the thinnest baking mat uh, possible could find um, uh, in the market. And I, I mold silicon on the top. My concern was if it will stick. Yeah. And uh, it, it actually, because I was thinking to use uh, glue, but if I glue it, how I can use it in the oven. But after a couple of tests, I realized that silicon stick perfectly to silicon. Natalia, hi, this is John. Hi, John, nice to hear you. Uh, Natalia was one of my most vocal students in a recent <laughs> workshop. She, she kept us all entertained. And you can... I, you didn't share this with us. This is a surprise to me. Because I didn't have permission by the time. <laughs> it was a sponsored class. I want to echo Kohar's uh, comment about the magnets. It, it seems like molded in snaps or hooks, you know, it would uh, be very effective uh, the way that you've demonstrated folding it mm -hmm. and storing it and, and all that. I, I think that would be a possibility. Um, one thing that that I think is kind of interesting, anytime you uh, bring um, plastic into uh, cooking environments, there's a very careful marketing approach to that. Uh, mm -hmm. Silicon, um, you know, is is safe to use in this this environment, but there's still kind of a pushback from people that are a little worried about that. Um, and so companies that use this kind of material in baking situations have a very specific approach to marketing and how they overcome that, that uh, pushback. So that might be something that uh, would be useful to it, include in any presentation you make of your idea mm -hmm. is to point to other companies that have similar marketability issues like that and and what approach did they take what what kind of promotion did they overcome that with that that might be helpful uh from the marketability standpoint 
I, I uh, covered it in my um, one of my presentation, unfortunately. Yeah, um, what I didn't have so much time now. Um, uh, the, the company who is uh, using silicon in their product, uh, they uh, they talk a lot about um, certificate certification. Um, they uh, try to make super clear all the um, concerns and and uh, technical uh, tech specs of material and another approach they take um so it's uh, first it's um uh, it's a health issue and another one is also environment issue because uh silicon um is um long-lasting product uh and that's what make it um sustainable so addressing the concerns about uh, um, recyclability of the silicones, com company usually offer the solution, if you wish, how it can be done. Yeah, like if you watch some of these uh, commercials at three o'clock in the morning for insomniacs like me, they talk about these pans that, these cooking pans that are nonstick. And they always mention mm -hmm. that they're approved by a certain agency for being food safe they they point to uh testing regulations that they've passed you know there's always some kind of comment like that that overcomes that that concern that people might have about uh mm -hmm. you know is is this safe for me to eat from yeah same here nice right. job thank you i i have a comment here it's uh this is really intriguing uh, you know, and, and, and yeah, it, it, take that as a good thing. Um, and, you know, in, in, in the kitchen, it's almost like different cooking materials um, and the way that you layer them or don't layer them will produce different results and the way they transfer heat, hold heat and so on for better, for worse and, and what you, you end up cooking. Um, and I'm really curious in, in what kind of results do you think this would produce and what it would be most optimal for cooking, if that makes sense. Um, because it might sound like um, like a bad thing, but actually quite the contrary. Maybe there's some really specific things that this is good for cooking, and maybe some that it's not. Um, and, and and if and in any case, I, I'd actually like to know what other functions could this be used for in the kitchen? Because uh, mm -hmm. this is sort of this idea for a single use uh, product to replace mm -hmm. a lot of things. Other way it can be used uh, rather than uh, baking and wrapping. You mean? And just in general in the kitchen, I noticed that the uh, opener, the yeah. opening slide had like, you could use it for this, that, and this. Yeah, it, it it can be, so you can prevent the surface from, um, I mean, you, you can put on this uh, piece a uh, hot pot or frying pans, or you can use uh, this um, as a towel, as a kitchen meat. Um, and yep. Yeah. This is one of the possibilities, which I listed in the beginning. Great. Well, if there's no other input from the judges, uh, we can take a quick little mental break and remind each other, your friends, family, and those around the planet to cast your vote right now. Hit the survey monkey. Thank link you. Smash Thank you. that link. Thank you, Natalia. <laughs> Text your friends close by. Test, you All can right. hit the construction workers up next door. I'm sure they're watching along at home. Okay, so now that everyone's voted, their family has voted, their friends, the whole lot, we're gonna move into the future, not necessarily just the present future, but the actual future. And this will mark the transportation design phase of the presentation. It's starting us off will be Santiago. He's gonna bring us his concept for the Jeep Precog. Hit it, Santi. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Santiago. This is my project. Um, it's the Jeep Precog. Um, the brief started with uh, design a vehicle as a work lifestyle platform. What was really key about this project was that um, taking into consideration what's going on right now with um, the pandemic and everyone being in like a lockdown, it was a very interesting brief for an automotive perspective to explore a persona who really enjoyed working from home, but maybe using the vehicle 
has a platform to work from wherever, from wherever he wants. So my persona was sort of based on this foundation. And the main idea behind the project is like to consider the, the car as a tool, as um, an extra piece of like equipment. So I started the project with looking at some of the equipment that he usually carries. He's a photographer. And because of that, he has like this really high tech equipment that he has to carry with him. And I thought it was a good philosophy for the car design as well. And then also looking at uh, what Jeeps do nowadays uh, when people go out camping and uh, what do they do now? And like, how does the equipment that work um, nowadays and how can we sort of like uh, change the perspective for like a work environment? So yeah, so the basis of the project, the concept was um, having the life mode and the work mode. In the life mode, we still wanted to sort of keep uh, in contact with the urban nature of the car. We wanted to sort of keep the arrow um, down and also keeping the iconic silhouette that Jeeps have that sort of created the SUV silhouette. So that's what we wanted to maintain if the light, in the life mode. But in the work mode, we, we were looking at expanding the spatial needs um, mainly. And also there was the idea of providing additional equipment support from the car because he has all this like high tech equipment for photography. So the first direction, I really started to carry like this theme of like very product design uh, feeling. One of the main reasons was that products are like extremely functional. Products are very um, useful and their um, form is dictated by their use. So I thought it was an interesting approach to it. First direction was sort of expanding uh, the rear portion of the car. So you have a little bit more space for you to take photog um, uh, photography from. One thing that I did sort of doing during uh, the project was my peers sort of told me to go away a little bit from the brand. Um, it's interesting to explore the brand in new definitions of what their language would be. And then this direction sort of arose with those um, thoughts. Um, if you see the, the top part, you see the life mode and the work mode. Um, so this is a very tiny package, uh, but you're centering the focus of the vehicle for the front. And when you're in work mode, you have um, both directions to have sort of like a desk maybe in the interior. And then for the final direction, um, I sort of went back to this idea of like the Jeeps where they can take their windshield off. It's a very interesting concept because you, you really connect to your context. And sort of, I, if you look at the bottom left sketch, um, what I was exploring is like this sort of like 360 view of the environment. Because a photographer is like, so dictated by his surroundings. I really wanted to capture that idea and the windshield having this form allowed it to have sort of this impact, uh, but you can take the windshields off as well. And then I explore that in the rear, maybe I have like this, um, if you look on the right side, there's like these three different modes uh, where you can lower this um, little like tent um, and it has like this sort of like plastic material that you can see through. So maybe if you're in the rain or in a snowy day, you still want to be connected, but not totally exposed to the exterior. So you can pop up this little tent and still work from the inside of your vehicle. Um, and then this was like some of the refinement phase, um, exploring this really open um, car. Again, really um, about connecting to your context and then carrying the brand through um, alongside these ideas. Aesthetics was uh, really important, as, of course. And then just really simplifying some of the surfacing and simple forms, but um, trying to keep that Jeep identity. And then for the final thing, um, the main thing was uh, the equipment support. I came up with like this drawer that you can put, um, pull out from the front. Because it's an electric platform, um, you, you have a lot of space that you could use for other things. Um, so this is where you can uh, store your uh, equipment, but you also have an interior access for that same drawer. Um, and then you have this 360 view from the front of the car. And in the back, you have this poppable tent where you can work from, uh, but still have this sort of transparency effect where you can still be connected. And these are like some of the final renders, just showing, uh, showing off a little bit of the aesthetics. And then in the back, there was this idea of using photochromic uh, materials that could react to sunlight. So you could still see outside, but maybe it becomes a little bit dimmer from the interior of the vehicle so you can still work um, tranquilly. Other final renders, here you can see like the 360 view that I was talking about or 180 view I should say actually. 
and then this was like a little space that you could use the hood of the car because it was so flat. Uh, you could place some of your equipment here and on the hood of the car. And maybe there's some tech that could be included with this surface. But here I just put like this little tripod to remember um, the idea of photography. And yeah, that's the, pretty much the project is just an in-context uh, sketch. Thank you, that's my project. Uh, Santiago, this is John, a very nice job. Um, I wondered if you could talk very briefly about your thinking of the ergonomics of entry and exit and some of those issues that it looks like that might be a little awkward. Uh, is this designed for nobody older than 30 years old or somebody like me who owns a Jeep could participate? Yeah, I mean, it's it's meant to be more of an adventure vehicle. I'm targeting it, at, targeting targeting um, the vehicle towards like a younger audience, uh, where it's people who really want to go to the outdoors and like go off roading, but still have this capability of having this sort of like mobile office for them, but with a, with a very outdoorsy perspective. I have a question. Hi, Santiago. Hi. This is Kohar Scott. Um, is the wheelbase, is it based on an existing Jeep or is it um, custom? I noticed two different proportions in one of the sketches. It looked, that one that you just passed by, it looks quite large. Is it a standard wheelbase or is it uh, larger? So the wheelbase is a little bit uh, longer than a Wrangler, normal Wrangler, um, but it's a little bit smaller than the current Gladiator that Jeep offers. Um, I do have some blueprints, but I'm, they're not here right now, but uh, it's like a medium-sized vehicle. Yeah. Yeah, and just to, to add on to that comment, I think it would really help sell this uh, in future contexts and when you have it in a portfolio to just uh, really sell us on the scale of this because uh, like Kohar said, in this view here, it looks quite massive, but in some of the other views, it's a bit more believable that it's uh, you know, something more or less that we're used to seeing today on the road. Yeah. Yeah, Santiago, hey, this is Aaron. Um, these are really, really cool sketches. They're really um, emotional. I really like the way uh, the drew them out. I'm really intrigued <clears throat> by the, um, the open air concept that you have there. I think that's really cool. I think you can almost play that up even more. I think what I keep hearing is um, you're talking about this experience of the customer who's going to be owning this car and almost living in it. And um, me being an interior designer for, you know, car company, I, I want to see more of that as well. I, I don't know if you've thought about exploring that, looking inside, um, you know, getting really into the use case. I, I feel like this customer really talks to me too. I like photography as well. Um, yeah, I think it could be something that actually adds a lot more substance to this project. Um, and then one quick comment too on the aesthetics too, this page in particular with the red sketches. I think um, it's really strong. I think what you had going on uh, early, you know, you have all this color blocking, really cool use of a uh, material. I think, you know, as you, as you get later in the program, I think, you know, there's some surfaces uh, in the final design, which, you know, you can always refine and look at uh, more so that maybe get a little bit thin, not as structural, I guess, you know, that I would think a Jeep would have, uh, yeah. maybe around the fenders and stuff like that. It's a little, you know, a little thin. Um, you want yeah. to be strong, I guess, as a Jeep brand. But I, I think overall, the the rest of the surfacing is great. Um, yeah. So yeah, but about the interior, sorry, I kind of rambled there. But yeah, have you thought about that? Oh yeah. Um, this project was done like over the summer, like super intense. Um, I didn't really have like the time to develop it, but uh, I, yeah, I, I am currently working a little bit more towards like the interior because it's a mobile office thing. So it's really relevant to create like an interior proposal for it. Yeah. So I will, yeah, I will probably develop it. Yeah, even if, even if in these renders, if you just show like a hint of it, just, mm -hmm. just to kind of show that you're thinking about that, you know, the environment, um, show that package layout, you know, how how he works in the back there and, you know, how yeah. they drive side by side in the front too. Um, to add to Melvin's point and everyone else's as well, um, I think that'll help uh, ground it into reality and, and scale and um, make it more of an, an actual concept versus just some, um, you know, the, this, this thought, I guess, as well. So yeah, Definitely. very cool though. Yeah. Hi, Santiago, it's Valentino. Um, yeah. Congratulations on the project, uh, really nice, uh, really interesting. Um, 
Are you, what I particularly like about your project is the approach is absolutely multidisciplinary. Is uh, a little bit uh, architectural, a little bit product design, transportation. It's uh, so many fields that they, they somehow um, all uh, uh, come together in this project. It's very interesting. Uh, uh, also, you know, presentation is really nice, really nice catching. Congratulations. Thank you. It's a lot. If anyone knows Jeep, it's Valentina. <laughs> <laughs> to that, uh, great if nobody has any other feedback for Santi. Uh, let's mm. take a trip even further into the future. Jenner is going to now present his Vivian SR1 concept. Jenner, if you're alive, join us. Absolutely. There he is, direct from the actual future. That's right. Hey everyone, my name is Jenner Polson, and I'm going to show you my Rivian Luxury Adventure SUV concept that I've codenamed the SR1. The SR1 was created around a story that exists in South Africa, but the underlying themes and problem solving could be applied to almost any location. Electric vehicles are generally disregarded when brought up as a viable option for adventure seekers in this area of the world, as there is a massive lack of infrastructure. In the future-based story of the SR1, engineers and designers have found ways to create a sustainable economic infrastructure that supports electric vehicles. This includes the use of man-made solar tree structures, these trees serve as a destination for humans and animals alike, a sort of safe place in a potentially harsh environment. The solar energy gathered by these trees is used to generate fresh water, power amenities within the structure, and charge electric vehicles. The SR1 is a battery electric vehicle with the dimensional properties of a traditional full-size SUV. Its height and clearance aid in its capability. The innovation and new experience lies in the seating arrangement. Though in side view, we are still talking about a traditional six-passenger volume, in plan view, you can see that the vehicle deviates from tradition. The unique use of vehicle automation allows the SR1 to break away from what we think of as a family experience in a car today. This vehicle uses levels two, three, and four automation. The vehicle separates this automation into three different drive modes, adventure, safari, and family mode. In adventure mode, the SR1's driver is essential as the vehicle uses combined automated functions like acceleration and steering in rough or challenging terrain areas. The driver must always be prepared to take full control of the vehicle and may be the one in control for the majority of the time. In family and safari mode, the interior layout, layout changes by rotating the seats 15 degrees inwards or outwards. In these modes, the SR1 uses level four automation, which will make the vehicle capable of performing all driving functions under certain conditions. I have based the creation of the SR1 around the story of a British family of four that travels to a South African game reserve for a safari adventure. They use this vehicle to get around the game reserve and tackle the challenging terrain of that area. The solar trees act as an oasis and hub during their travels. Modern South African architecture has had a massive impact on both the exterior and interior design of this vehicle by following the architecture principle of imposing glass onto large concrete surfaces, the users will feel protected within the structure, but not uncomfortable due to the large viewports and massive amount of light in the space. During the design process, I was able to sculpt a large chiseled light catcher into the body side to balance the side view graphics. Once this theme of large bold graphics was established on the body side, I was able to have a lot of fun experimenting with the front and rear forms. My goal was to maintain a vehicle attitude that exuded capability, but still felt familiar to luxury vehicle owners. The stance of the vehicle and frontal graphics are heavily inspired by the visual presence of African elephants. The rear of the vehicle was designed around function. It continues the theme of the large glass surfaces and takes advantage of the low load floor to provide its users with easy access to the rear of the vehicle. I was able to refine the details of each form to achieve a balanced final design that provided an exterior appearance that was undoubtedly tough and capable. The traditionally long dash to axle provides a premium look that is complemented by a singular horizontal lighting element intersected by two strong vertical elements to match Rivian's new design DNA. A strong feature line spurs off of this frontal lighting element and wraps around the car, adding a horizontal structure to the large body side graphics and rear. The roof mounted additional battery pack adds to this tough look and allows the users to spend all day on the safari plane without having to stop for a charge. Creating an interior that embraced all of the elements from the exterior was a challenge. Throughout many ideation sketches, one main theme stuck. That theme was the evolution of a traditional center console. I call this the Rivian Mag Beam, or RMB. This is a central beam that ex exits the bottom of the dashboard, extends to the rear of the vehicle, wraps upwards to the headliner, and then returns to the top of the dashboard near the windshield. 
The external battery pack also evolved with this creation. It houses solar panels within the pattern that acknowledge the interior. Throughout the ideation and development process, I used storyboards to work out the human element of this design. There were many ergonomic challenges involved with this large beam and seats that rotate inwards and outwards. I designed a seat that has armrests that lower to the bottom of the seat to allow for easy access and a clutter-free environment when the vehicle is in family mode. To continue this simple environment, the accessories on the Rivian mag beam can be easily stored in the dash or on the upper portion of the beam as they ride on secure electromagnetic carriers. On the bottom left here, you can see that the SR1 is set up to camp out for the night. The seats are folded flat and the removable bed slats are in place. To the right of that, you will see the vehicle in adventure mode on its way to the solar trees with the on windshield HUD displaying a constellation map. The final interior design emphasizes the strength and structure that is displayed on the exterior while providing a more soft and welcoming environment with features that could change how people interact within a vehicle. I used digital 3D modeling through Alias to explore the design even further and ultimately ground both the interior and exterior concepts in reality. Seeing the design in three dimensions and adjusting it to gain the feel I was after is definitely the most rewarding part of this process. Thank you for joining me on this design adventure and thank you all for supporting us as students. Are there any questions I can answer about my project? I had a quick question on the um, that center, um, I forget what you called it actually, but the structure that you have that mimics the uh, the DLO on the outside, that's, that's really cool. Um, thank you. What's the, uh, what's the material on that and what, what is it Exactly, um, what's its significance other than holding the console items and have a structural element? Is it, is it related to the battery that's on the roof as well? I guess I'm trying to sure. see so, that in the presentation. Yeah, it, it provides a sort of a visual sense of strength. It does not have any physical uh, attachment aside from the fact that it does mount the seats uh, in the front of the vehicle. So there's no actual rail system for the seats to mount on as a traditional vehicle would have. Uh, and that's shown in my final interior rendering. You can see that under the seats, there is uh, no actual uh, bottom there. And those are attached to that uh, support that extends off of the rail. And mm -hmm. uh, my thoughts for material on that would be uh, something very premium and, and certainly strong, like a carbon titanium uh, or some sort of metal, as that matches Rivian's design DNA pretty, pretty well. Um, and then the top of it, we were considering a material such as micarta, which is uh, a material that gets grippier if it's wet, uh, and it, it's pretty resistant against uh, stains and things of that sort. Um, but that material may also be used for the floor or headliner. Yeah, I think the um, the development of this this whole project is is um, is very strong. At least the uh, the storyboarding of it, understanding the actual project and um, the use case, especially for the interior. Um, the exterior. The exterior is nice as well. I think there's a lot of, um, to, to me, I, I really see a lot more in the tier and thought process, especially that center mounted structural element we just talked about. I'd almost wonder if um, seeing more of that in the exterior, having that kind of play through somehow, I don't know with maybe a different material finish, but um, you know, may, maybe that would add something more to it. But yeah, I think just the process and the, the storyboarding here is amazing. You know, I really, I really understand this, the, this product and the customer, it's, it's, it's really cool. Um, yeah, congratulations on this project, very neat. Can you go back two slides actually? Sorry, Andy, there we go, yeah. Yeah, these are cool. I think I think maybe just showing um, a little bit more early on iteration of um, forms that differ from each other quite differently to show that even if this is the path that you knew that you wanted, I guess, you know, we sometimes have that idea already, you know, we, we know what we want and we illustrate it. Of course. Um, it's always good to show the other options just to say, well, that's, you know, that's the reason I didn't go for that. Because um, when I look at this page, I, I almost see the last page as well. It, it's very similar, um, which is not, I'm not saying it's a bad thing that you start here. You know, I think your design is very uh, well thought out, but maybe just a few more iterations of um, completely different designs, I guess, on this page, just to show, you know, that that progression, I guess, and, and that you wouldn't go that way. You want to go with this way. So, yeah, very good, though. Absolutely. And that's something I can definitely include in my portfolio, as there were several other directions that uh, ultimately mm -hmm. did not work out. Yeah. I like that top left sketch, the smallest one. It's always the smallest one, yeah. that, that little thumbnail. Thank you so much. <laughs> Jenner, if you don't um, mind me chipping in here too, I, I just want to second a lot of Aaron's comments, a lot of um, really good things you called out there. And I'd like to reiterate the fact that you went through this entire design process and addressed the human element in a, in a really nice and comprehensive way and in a storytelling fashion, which I, I definitely appreciate there. Um, 
although one thing you did call out automation levels, but you didn't address the interactions. Right now, resolving uh, levels one through five, in my opinion, uh, comprehensively and responsibly is probably one of the biggest challenges the automotive industry is facing right now. So if you have something meaningful to design there, I think you should definitely explore it if you have ideas, because not only would you be sort of um, thinking of these really important ideas to the automotive industry, but you'd also come up with, I would imagine, a, a competitive advantage here among your peers because uh, whatever you, you come away with that, you might be able to innovate around the interior's design, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, yeah, level one through five has a lot of different uh, takeaways. And I'd be really curious to see how that all, um, uh, how, how that all uh, uh, comes down to this one experience and how you lay that out um, uh, very clearly is, is important to that. Uh, honestly, I may not really mention it too much if you can't really dig into it. I would just sort of um, gloss over it a little bit. But if you want to talk about those interactions in the future, uh, just um, connect with me offline. And I think it'd be a great opportunity to explore that and what it means to your vehicle's design. Absolutely, Melvin. I, I definitely will uh, talk to you about that. It's something I'm really interested in. I think that you've done a really good job with this. I think your thought process has been presented very thoroughly. Um, I, I don't really have any questions, um, but I'm just, I'm really impressed with the thoroughness of your, your project. Um, and I also like how you talked about um, what it's saying graphically, because um, I, I think that's important to, to look at what kind of message the overall feeling of the aesthetic is. So good job, congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah, I wanna echo, um, yeah, you're really grappling with very um, deep complexity here and congratulations on being able to keep it all in one presentation and you tackled quite a bit and um, really very well. Uh, I can, um, one, one thing I have a question about is your inspiration on materials. And uh, I guess one feedback would be right there where you show the interior, all of the quality of everything is very much had in illustration. I guess it would be nice to tie it into some sort of reality if there's a way to combine what materials in, in terms of like, what are those finishes? Are They're all very two dimensional right now. And I'd like to get a sense of the depth of any different variations on material surface finishes, um, whether they're soft or, or they're all hard, are they um, manufactured, are they synthetic, are they, you know, I don't have any information on that. And that would be the one thing missing for me is to get a little bit more in understanding of what that material experience is. Are they gonna be cold finishes? Are they um, warm? Is there any sense of that uh, contrast? Thank you for that input. I, I definitely think that's somewhere I need to improve and I totally see your point. But good job. Thank you. Well, if you two aren't gonna grill, I'm, I'm gonna appoint Valentina to do so. Uh, I don't have a question, so I can just uh, join the chorus of, uh, you know, really good job, really impressive. Uh, I think that it's very interesting the way you are treating this car as really um, an interface uh, with the humans and the human experience. I think that's extremely important. Yeah, I do agree with Kohar that we would like to see a little bit of more uh, information about uh, the CMF of things to finish us to understand how you imagine that interaction with humans. Uh, because uh, functionality is one, but then, you know, what's the emotion? What, what do you remember of this experience and journey? What does it come to you as, you know, in terms of tacticality of that experience? That's the imagine. But congratulations, really nice catching. Really nice. Thank you so much. I definitely yeah. would like to improve on the uh, emotional side of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think in this case, really, materiality means emotions. It's probably the only part that is really missing from this project uh, is that you explain wonderfully the experience, but uh, how is that experience in terms of emotions and feelings? Thank you. I'll definitely look into that. Jenner, this is John Gunther. I just have a very quick comment. Is uh, 
very nice job uh, besides that. Um, sometimes it's helpful on projects like this that are a little more targeted as to their use definition is to, without designing variations, is to make a statement about what would you change if this uh, had a different use function? Uh, for instance, um, you know, more everyday use, um, you know, would there be changes? Would there be modifications that you would suggest the car company that would do the, to make a broader uh, market penetration? Um, you know, I, I like having a theme of where you've uh, designed the product to excel in that theme. Uh, but sometimes it's helpful to make a statement beyond that as would there be other modifications to make it uh, have a broader appeal to a broader market? I certainly think there would be some modifications to have this appeal, uh, especially in the US market. Um, I, I think that using this sort of large body side glass is something that may not be uh, as approachable for, for US customers or something that uh, may not be as in intriguing for them. So that's definitely something that that I think might have to change or be modified. Um, well, I'll, I'll push back on that. I, I want glass on the side of my door. Uh, this is exciting for me. And I don't know how I'm going to pull that off, but I may have to go to the shop and see if they can do something for me. Well, you're the perfect client. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Well, congratulations, Jenner, on nailing your first client. Thank and you. more than that, congratulations to all of you for your presentations this evening. Uh, while we have you here as a captive audience, we'd like to send a shout out here to our class of 2020. And just play you a brief video of some of the uh, year end highlights before we move on to the actual judging component. So Antonio, whenever you're ready, let's kick the vid. Congratulations, class of 2020. You're out there. Uh, this is just a reminder to the judges to submit your sheets after this. But also, we'd like to take this opportunity to give each and every one of you judges a little statement and uh, a chance to review what you've seen today, a little bit of a takeaway and uh, something to inspire the students of the future here. Looks like John is uh, just chomping at the bit to go first. So in a rare change of events, I'm gonna call on you, Mr. Gunther. Well, um, through the years, I've always been watching the uh, AEU program and uh, as a person that hires uh, designers into, the, into our organization, it's, it's uh, evolved over the years and it's got to be a very impressive level right now. And I congratulate the students that are that are producing this kind of quality of work and innovation. Um, you know, I, I've just seen this program grow in, in the quality and the, the skill levels and the output. Um, you know, these, these students are very attractive to professionals hiring them. So uh, congratulations to all the students of doing really high quality work and, you know, congratulations to the program being very effective. Thanks so much, John. I know everybody appreciates a kind and wise word from you. Uh, I guess if we're going into Z formation, I'm gonna call on Aaron next. If you wanna give us a little feedback and a, a little wrap up. Yeah, um, everyone's presentation was amazing. Uh, 
you know, I was at Academy of Art 10 years ago now, and it's, it's kind of amazing to see everybody's pr progression, um, you know, students continuing with almost, you know, like new ways to present some of these videos, the visual presentation of it. Um, you know, we're doing this on Zoom. This is, this is kind of an amazing thing. And then seeing each person um, kind of have a little bit of influence on each other. I, I can tell that, you know, something that I, I remember being at the Academy, um, having, you know, that camaraderie with a lot of other students uh, versus maybe, you know, we've heard about some other places, but um, I can see that you guys build off each other and influence each other. And I, I don't want you guys to lose that now that you're on Zoom as well, or, you know, however you communicate, uh, continue that going. It, it really makes yourself uh, marketable um, as an employee, wherever you go, wherever you end up, that, that ability to work with others, to research with others, um, to grow, uh, take, take critique. So um, yeah, I just want to congratulate you guys on uh, putting yourself out there tonight as well. This is really awesome. Thank you, everyone. Even if it is from the comfort of your homes, but congratulations anyway, indeed. <laughs> so far, is there anything you'd like to wrap up with? Uh, I'll also say uh, congratulations to everybody. All the work that uh, that you presented was really well thought out. I was really impressed with the level of dedication to the entire process of um, start ideation research. All of those things are so important and will set you apart as you go into the field uh, seeking employment or whatever it is, whether you're developing your own products or, or seeking employment with, um, with a firm. So uh, good job, congratulations. And also I saw in the chat that there's two first year, um, was it Ken and Heidi? Congratulations to you both for making it to a spotlighted position the first year. Um, that's great and uh, yeah. Um, I'll leave with one thing. I was an English major before I was a product designer, industrial designer. So be sure you go over your work, look for typos. I saw a few, but I'm, <laughs> as you guys uh, finalize your portfolio, um, have somebody else proofread. <laughs> That's some actual sage advice. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> Had to say it, sorry. <laughs> yeah, if we're not visually communicating. We're communicating one way or another. Mostly with words that we're reading. <laughs> Uh, well, to that, Reiko, if you wouldn't mind piggybacking on uh, what Kohar said. Sure. Um, well, I've taught at Art Center and I've been part of um, crits for students at Cal State Long Beach and Art Center. And I have to say the quality of work that I've seen tonight is outstanding. Um, I'm really impressed. I'm, I'm impressed not only with the work, but the way that everybody presented. Um, all of you are well-spoken and you communicate your ideas clearly. Um, you're very professional and I see bright futures for all of you. Um, it made judging very difficult <laughs> um, because I, I think you guys all scored really high and I think you should be really um, proud of the work that you showed tonight. So congratulations. Awesome guys. Hey, if Rego says you crushed it, <laughs> something close to correct. Uh, and Melvin, if you wouldn't mind just kind of following up the pack here and giving us a headliner take on what you've seen this evening. Yeah, I just want to wish you all congratulations, uh, the, especially the first timers making it um, to this larger stage. Congratulations uh, for those of you moving on. Uh, stay positive. I know this is a really strange year. Uh, it's, it's affected us all in different ways whether you're seeking employment or, but also don't hesitate to um, pursue your entrepreneurial ambitions too. Um, just keep your head up. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get past this and um, stay, stay curious, uh, stay observant and um, keep looking forward. Great, thanks so much, Melvin. I think that uh, you're definitely a sage and guiding hand to a lot of these students and some of us, we still hold you here in our hearts. <laughs> Uh, to that, uh, let's open it up for some Q&A if there's anything outstanding, uh, any sort of loose ends you guys would like to tie up, now would be the time to do it. Uh, judges, your assignment, of course, is to turn in your homework. We're watching. Those of you at home and here in the audience, also don't forget to vote. This is your chance to play from your sofa and make sure your voice is heard. Uh, right, Jose. Uh, this is back to Alex. 
Uh, he had a question about how the drip was powered. Actually, uh, the drip has a battery door. So you, you have two big batteries. In the main body, you have like the base and the PCBs. You have two big batteries. Of, so it's basically rechargeable, like with the door. There's a uh, rendering with the door so you can recharge like a cell phone. If there's any other loose ends and questions from anybody in the audience, student-wise, uh, between judges, uh, maybe even some of the student panelists take on the situation. I'd love to have some feedback in that respect. Natalia, I know you're chomping at the bit to give a little feedback. So we'll start with you. Thank you so much, Andy. This is a product-driven question. If uh, it's possible to, um, uh, to apply any pattern on silicon, which will be used for baking? Um, this is Reiko. I, I think that it is the usually silicone um, is either injection molded or compression molded. And so whatever texture you want to have would be in the tool. Um, and mm -hmm. then silicone um, picks up those textures really well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not possible. No ink, right? Only uh, molding. Um, yeah, there's silicone inks, um, but I'm not sure about uh, it being durable enough to withstand washing and mm -hmm. um, the heat. Um, that's something that I think you would need to do some research on. Um, I would think that the suppliers um, would be able to give you some insight on that. Were you able to ask any of the suppliers that question? Um, uh, yes, I, I asked them, but I didn't get the reply. <laughs> okay. Difficult. Yeah, mo most of the silicone that I've dealt with has been for consumer electronics. It hasn't been for um, baking or cooking. And mm -hmm. um, there's new developments right now uh, with uh, different silicone paints even, um, which is really interesting. But again, the paints, I don't know how it would do with baking, but I've seen some nice treatments where there's a, a molded substrate and then you spray it with a different color and then you can laser etch away the, the sprayed layer to expose the base layer color oh, yes. um, so that that could be and also there's uh, like a double injection molding where you can mold one color and then mold another color mm -hmm. on top of that um, but you the way that the colors are separated there's usually a part line between them because the tool has to shut off the material flowing in so you have more of a gap between the colors, whereas laser etching away, it's seamless. Mm -hmm. But there, there's right. definitely possibilities. Yeah. You just have to make sure that it can withstand the, the high All temps. Right, uh, the, I, was gonna, information. I was gonna mention also the in-mold, there's um, more and more innovation in in-mold decoration where like Reiko mentioned, you can have a material in the compression mold or the injection mold that gets sandwiched between during the process of molding. Um, and if it was a transparent material, you could see through it. So it would show through potentially. Um, but I would also um, having, uh, I, I am an impulse silicone product buyer, unfortunately, I'll admit it. Um, so I have a, a whole cabinet full of silicone baking products that don't work. And the number one reason is, I'll ask the students who can say, <laughs> what doesn't work with silicone products in baking? Let me see. It starts with a D. It's a, uh, dirt, dirt. Draft angle. <laughs> Draft angle. Oh, I see. <laughs> so that's like the number one thing I would really um, think about in terms of texturizing mm -hmm. or considering the Good. material finish for um, silicone is mm -hmm. um, have a severe draft angle and minimal texture because anything that you texturize it with has a potential of mm -hmm. having a food cavity, um, you know, maintaining the food in there. 
And mm -hmm. that would be one of the things I would be concerned about in the grooves of your product. So uh, you can have visually that that texture going on, but have severe drafts so that it releases food and not capturing it. Thank you for valid advice. Natalia, yeah. you might uh, also consider looking into some of the work that NASA has done for space exploration. They use a lot of silicon mm -hmm. for their food uh, containment and, and cooking and things like that in outer space. Mm -hmm. It's some interesting things. Uh, maybe uh, Elon Musk has even experimented with things. He's an innovator. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's some interesting sources to go exploring, you know, to get uh, get uh, Im impressions and, and um, you know, get, get you excited about a particular thought process, the inspirations and that. All right, thank you so much. Thanks so much. John. Well, speaking of inspirations, yeah. Dan, do you have any other materials, questions you have while the panel is before you? I think, uh... I'm good. The only question is like uh, about some materials is um, I'm thinking about, I, I just wondering how durable my products can be like, um, like uh, if I use comp compression molding for cork, or recycled cork. Yeah, that's the, the, the only problems I have so far. Yeah, I, I was wondering because you've got some live hinges on it. And yeah. I, I don't know how um, durable the uh, cork would be, you know, how yeah. many times you could fold it and unfold it. Yeah, one, one thing I tried is like uh, the can put uh, one layer of um, te textile, like a frame inside of the, the two layers of cork and uh, combining together. And that creates uh, the flexibility and uh, the durability. Yeah, but um, I still like want to get know if there's like a, more <laughs> about this. I think you're thinking in the right direction and kind of um, even drawing on the same um, inspiration as Natalia, you can have, a, and I think that's what you were saying is one material substrate. And then, you know, you're creating a composite if you're concerned about recyclability, which I think we all should be, then um, consider what could and I'm trying to think, you know, on the spot, what that could be, um, materials that could be uh, composted down or recycled. Um, the only materials that I know that will withstand long cycles of a live hinge is, is polyethylene and polypropylene. Um, uh, true. Propylene. But and 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 those those have, uh, I think, those are the typical ones that we'll use for live hinges because of their. Um, long cycle life. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Ken, I was thinking like instead to fold, maybe you have like this, like a tube, could be an option too, I don't know. Like yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, but the, the other side for this is, uh, I, that's uh, where I started from my concepts. Uh, the, uh, the reason why I'm ending up on life engine because it's I want this product to be more compact um, to save the space. Yeah. Well, I'm going to take this opportunity to put Mr. John Rosner on the spot and try to get some uh, takeaways from your point of view. Really, I'm very impressed with the innovation, the brilliance, absolute brilliance. Um, love the comments the judges made. I will admit I very much missed coming in and um, seeing the work in detail, what the students did. It's, it's the small pictures on, on my screen don't do justice to what the students did, have done here. Just tremendous creativity. Um, really very, very, very impressed with everything. And with, with the one product, um, I'll, I'll, I'll loan up to my prejudices here, uh, Natalia came up with that I've been out on the barbecue and in the kitchen and yeah where can I buy it <laughs> and I'll send it to you <laughs> the, the rest of the designs here all of them just 
tremendous. Really, really, really neat. Okay, Jose's got a question. Uh, Jose says, I have a question for the judges. As people that work in the industry when recruiting, do you prefer to see a little bit more projects that are blue sky and a little more concept? Or do you prefer to see projects that can be manufactured from one day to the other or a mix of both? Uh, I love that question. I think that's a really great, uh, important question to ask as you're graduating. And what I tell my students and what I've seen in my experience, because I, I graduated from Art Center and so our portfolios were very conceptual and I get a lot of, um, you know, I take a little bit of flack from um, San Jose State from, from the um, practical side because we teach from a very much, a much more manufacturing reality-based instruction. I think it's important to have conceptual work. And the reason why is because as we go out in the world, we're informing, we're, we're dreaming up the future. And I think it's important to have some basis of reality. I think that in the end, you wanna be able to showcase your ability to solve a problem realistically, but it's super important to have conceptual work as well because it shows for one, your ability to think outside of the box. I've worked for a variety of companies from um, infomercial companies to consumer electronics and pro audio. And even the most basic design job that I had, they wanted to see conceptual work uh, and they want to be inspired. So I think it's important as designers for us to inspire as well as to be able to bring it into reality as well. I, I have a comment on that. As usual, I always agree with Cohart. So we, we're, we're, uh, we're right on track there. I, I think to what the point she was making also is um, when I would hire designers, I, I needed that mix because invariably when you make a proposal to management, executives, uh, design director, whoever, uh, even um, some uh, customers picked out, you show them a vision, you show them something more in advance on what you're really going to deliver so that they understand there's this whole possibility out there and, and you get them excited about that future. Invariably, you're going to back up and put something together into the marketplace that, that is manufacturable and cost effective and all those type of things. But uh, you have to inspire other people that there's even more potential uh, to the concept and that takes somebody that that has that skill so I always hired people that that had a, a good mix of those types of skills the 2001 space odyssey you know we when we where we were first introduced to the ipad <laughs> I mean and to kind of piggyback on that is there some advice you as established professionals would give to you as your student selves several years ago? Just a little bit of insight into what's to come for these young designers. I might add on to that. And it's kind of kind of based on, you know, what we're talking about um, being creative and going out there and doing um, a little bit more blue sky work or doing stuff, stuff that's more honed in. Um, you know, don't you don't have to have all the answers, <laughs> you know, we have this. Here, I'm just reading the screen here, but um, you know, you don't have to have all the answers in your portfolio necessarily, but you just have to show that eagerness to learn, that eagerness to approach a project and explore, and uh, your ability to discern what's good, hone it in, and focus on it at, at the very end of the project. Um, you know, I I think looking back, I wanted to know, you know, how how things are manufactured, or you know, who's going to go in this automobile, um, you know. Just, just show that that thought process, you know, that you're walking along that path. And uh, I think that's what a manufacturer wants to look for. And, you know, education never ends at school. You keep learning on the job. You keep learning um, from peers and projects. So um, it's a journey. Incredible insight. Thank you again, Aaron. Um, but now is the moment I think we've all been waiting for. The uh, winners have been tallied and the results are in. The Academy of Art 2020 
Winter Show winner of best product is Ken Raw. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. The 2020 Academy of Art Winter Show Award for best transportation goes to Jenner Poulton. Thank you all so much. Good job, Jenner. Thank, Thank you. Congrats, guys. The 2020 Academy of Art Winter Show Award for the most innovative product goes to Alex Altino for the drink. And last but not least, Thank you. the Crowd Fave Award goes to Laura for the Orchid Pot. Laura, are you in the audience tonight? Oh, thank you so much. There she is. Don't thank us. Thank your peers. Uh, well, thanks again, everybody, for taking time out of your busy weeks to join us for these couple hours on a Thursday. Uh, I think I, more than anyone, would like to hear a little closing statement from Tom, Hideki, and Antonio. Well, I just want to thank everyone again. Uh, we really appreciate you guys coming out and supporting our students. Uh, I also would like to thank the students for all their hard work. Um, I know it's been a difficult semester, but um, you guys have really shown a lot of fortitude. Um, and we really appreciate all the time and effort that you put into your work. Um, you guys are, after all, what makes us a great university. It's, it's, it starts with you guys. So we really appreciate your work ethic. And um, I know, again, you know, hopefully we're, we're going to be able to get through this pretty soon. And uh, we'll be back in the studio and back in our home sweet home, the warehouse. Uh, I know we're all excited to get back to it. Um, but again, I, I couldn't be any more proud of you all. Uh, thank you again for, for everything that you guys did to pull this off. Great show, guys. Thank you, Antonio. You know, I'm, I'm just so happy that we got a great team, Antonio, Andy, Mark, and Hideki, you know, and we got a great graduate students here like Aaron, Melvin, and, and you know, all grown up. I mean, <laughs> Aaron's 10 years already, I couldn't believe. And Melvin started in, when he was like age 15 or 14 on a high school program. So I don't, I never thought he's gonna leave because he's been there for like seven, eight years. <laughs> now he's grown up and been doing a really good professional job. So again, program is really healthy and uh, good team to continue our success. So, and I just just thank you so much for spending your time. It's really mean a lot to the students as well. Thank you. Thank you to the judges. Thank you to all the teachers. Thank you to the IND office, but especially thank you to the students. You guys are super inspiring. Um, just a quick story. One of the winners today came to me, um, let's say, you know, less than a year ago. Uh, didn't even have their uh, first class and was kind of begging for a scholarship, begging for some help financially. And I basically told him, or I told them, uh, well, you gotta earn it. And uh, he worked hard, he um, persevered, he worked through some, um, some tough challenges, challenges with me, uh, especially. And, and today he's, he's walking away with a nice, a nice scholarship and uh, he's only in his first year. So congratulations to him, congratulations to, to all of you. And as, thank you, Mark. And as we said before, no one's walking away uh, without anything. So everyone that was a finalist today uh, will also receive a scholarship. So um, thank you all again for your participation. Hideki is, are we uh, sitting here as well? Yeah. So first of all, thank you for the judges for joining tonight. Um, and uh, wonderful comments. Uh, all of us are, are very appreciative of that. Um, and thank you for the team. Uh, you know, uh, we couldn't have done any of it, especially Antonio, Andy. Um, 
And thank you for students. Um, I know it's the really tough time. Um, you don't have access to our facilities, but uh, you're staying you know, healthy and doing a really good job. And it's been really hard for many of you for the past few, especially for, for the past few weeks. Um, so I congratulate you all for doing excellent work and uh, you know, you're inspiring the next generation of uh, students or uh, student to be. So thank you all. Absolutely fantastic work. I know there's been a lot of adversity that you've all faced, not having access to the most convenient ways of either manufacturing or creating. But the triumph, I think, is all in your hands. And if you made it through this, man, only got the rest to crush. So congratulations again. Give each and every one of yourselves a hand. It's been super fun. Maybe even more fun for us than you. <laughs> and uh, as a friendly reminder, um, our website will be continuously um, updated from now until finals. Uh, finals are next week for us. So we do have some new projects to share. Uh, we will be sending uh, e-blasting some emails when our full show is on display. So we look forward to sharing that with you all. Uh, for everyone on YouTube, thank you for, uh, for tuning in and then watching the show tonight. And again, once again, thank you very much to the judges. Thank you very much to the students and to our team as well for helping us put this together. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks for everything.